who has been a colleague of mine of many years, um, Mr Mark Elwell. When I first met Mark, he was a short, dark, curly-haired ancient Egyptian. And I knew him as that for, oh, how many years? Years before I knew that he was, in fact, this gentleman you see before you today. Um, Mark has been an educator for 30 years. He's the founder of the Hakusan International School in Japan, from where he's come to talk to us today, which is the first school in Japan where the medium of instruction and everything is English. Uh, he's been a visiting lecturer in technical communication at Japan, Japan Advanced Institute of Science and Technology. And he invented, basically, although I must say I wrote a paper with him, so we did but mostly him, a method for using virtual environments for teaching. Um, and he does a lot of development in both Second Life and in OpenSim for educational uses. Please welcome Mr. Mark Elwell. Okay, good morning, everyone. Uh, while we're getting things set up here, I'd just like to clarify that my school is the first international school in the region of Japan, where I am. There are many in the big cities, but I'm in a rural area on the Japan seaside. Have you had applicants working before? Um, we did have it at one stage over there. Thank you very much, and we'll get going now. Uh, good morning, I'm Mark Elwell, and uh, today my talk is Climbing the Garden Wall, an Educator's Odyssey in Second Life and Open Sim. Or, whatever happened to Second Life and who cares? Okay. Uh, so before I go any further, how many of you have made a Second Life account and logged in at least once? Okay. How many of you have uh, logged into Second Life in the last five years? Okay, all right, so I think that's a good starting point. Uh, so uh, this is the outline of what I'll be talking about today. I'll be, uh, of course, focusing on my own experiences, but I'll try to uh, also provide some information and, with any luck, some insight into what happened and why it happened and why OpenSim, the open source uh, version of the Second Life server software, hasn't taken over and, and changed the world. Okay, so first of all, how I got involved with uh, Second Life, all this goes back to the year 2006, which was a pivotal year in my life, a lot of new departures. I was no longer able to continue using Amiga OS, and so I started using Ubuntu. I've still been using it since then. And then there were a lot of other things that, uh, that changed and moved forward in that year. First of all, I'd heard of Second Life, uh, but didn't really jump in. I'm a pretty dedicated free tard, so I didn't want to spend any money, and I was skeptical about where it would go. Um, and, uh, and there are a few other things going on. I'll mention them one by one. Okay, so first of all, what is Second Life? This is a question that I'll be returning to time and again because nobody seems to know. Uh, originally, it was started by a fellow who had uh, made a video conferencing program and then sold it to Real and put his money into making the metaverse from Snow Crash, because uh, how many of you have read Snow Crash? Yes. Uh, how many of you think it's still great? Okay. So of course, the metaverse was this big deal in there, and there was also a little something that we would now call cryptocurrency and so forth. So a lot of really interesting and amazing stuff in there. And so it's no surprise that this fellow, fellow Philip Rosedale, decided, hey, I've got this 20 million bucks. Why don't I put it? into making the metaverse happen. Well, of course, uh, at the turn of this century, uh, there were some technical obstacles, I think, still to be overcome. And so what ended up getting made 
was in many ways not exactly uh, what was portrayed in, uh, in Snow Crash. In some ways, better, and in other ways, not so much. Okay. Um, and I was, at that time, really excited about something different, and that was Neverwinter Nights. Uh, 2006, it was only, had only been out for about four years, right? And I thought, this is the big deal because you have customizable user-generated content. Uh, it was intended as an implementation of Dungeons & Dragons, the tabletop uh, role-playing game, uh, on computers where you would have people playing remotely and be able to play together and someone could run a special Dungeon Master client and actually make things happen like the Dungeon Master does. Uh, and so I thought, wow, this is, this is really important. I'm never going to play a single player game again. And so it looks, you know, like uh, from 2002, your typical sort of uh, uh, hack and slash kind of thing. But as I say, it has uh, features that allowed it to be a whole lot more. And in fact, a Bioware, the developers gave uh, everybody who bought the game the same tool set they used to make their official campaign. Uh, so I was really excited about all that. And I also, uh, that year, had just recently started uh, working as a visiting lecturer at the Japan Advanced Institute of Science and Technology, which is a grad school and research institute. And the atmosphere there at that time was really great. Everybody was encouraged to get involved in research, go publish, uh, go to conferences. And uh, it, was, it was really great. And so I got lured into that because I was reviewing a paper for a grad student, a doctoral student. And uh, he was writing about uh, a web-based Dungeons and Dragons type uh, role playing uh, activity. And when he found out that I was somewhat knowledgeable about that sort of thing, he got really excited. So we have to write a paper, we have to write a paper. And so I got lured into research. Um, and then I discovered that there's this whole field of game based learning. Uh, how many of you are familiar with James Paul G? Not very many, okay. But his big thing is that you play World of Warcraft or Battlefield or whatever, and, and this is very educational. You learn problem solving skills and engagement and all sorts of things that are useful. But if you just take the games as they are, there's a pretty clear limit to how far you, how much value you're gonna get out of that educationally. And so I was saying, well look, with Neverwinter, why don't we design things that are intended to be learning activities? Um, and so we did design various things. Uh, we designed one where the conversation tree system in Neverwinter is very useful. And uh, uh, the idea was that the users, the students, would interact with uh, NPCs and learn if they used effective communication skills, since communication skills is what we were teaching. Uh, they would learn how to make the uh, different proportions of uh, copper and tin to make the bronze to make a bell and to make a spike to, to nail it up. And then if they could ring the bell, then they had successfully completed the task. And so we were really excited about that sort of thing. Then at the end of the year, another grad student came in and hit us with the huge tsunami of uh, hype about SL, Second Life, that was just starting to, uh, to wash ashore. And of course, the main focus of this hype was uh, a woman called An She Chung, who had become a US dollar millionaire dealing real estate in Second Life. And so this, as you see, Business Week, and a lot of mainstream media got very, very excited. And everybody wanted to rush in. Coca-Cola, Toyota, Reuters uh, established a, a, a news office there, this sort of thing. Because, of course, it had not been very many years since uh, the dot-com boom and the emergence of the web. And there were a lot of people who felt they had missed out or gotten left behind. And they really wanted to be in on this one. Uh, and so that was the... the um, uh, as I say, sort of, sort of not quite the crest, but near the crest of the wave of hype about Second Life. And that's when uh, my colleagues and I got involved. So during 2007, uh, I explored a lot of different roles and functions inside Second Life. And here are some of them, and I'll talk about them a little bit. So what's a camper? And why would I be paid to sit in a shoebox casino? Uh, the way that things were in those days was a little bit like the wild frontier, and gambling was a big deal in Second Life at that time. Uh, and so what people would do is they'd set up these casinos with a few scripted uh, blackjack machines or, or uh, slot machines, and then if the place was ever empty, then if one punter came in, he'd look around, nobody's there, he'd leave. And then 10 seconds later, the next one would come in. And, and so uh, it was in the interest of the operators of these casinos to actually pay people to sit there. 
They didn't have to play the machines, but just by being there, if someone came in, oh, there are people here. And then uh, those people would go ahead and play the machines. And this was an effective enough model that there were these casinos everywhere. And there was one where uh, my colleague Steve Cook from Adelaide and I used to uh, sit while we were doing other work. And then every 10 minutes when we were challenged to type in the right number, you know, we would just click that and move on. Um, and so that was something that we did. And this is the earliest iteration of my avatar, my first avatar. And then the, uh, the next role that we took on was that of landowner, because of course the land rush was on and everyone was wanting to be the next Tan Shei Cheng, right? So uh, we gathered a consortium, a syndicate of people in the office and each uh, put in about 100 US and uh, bought a piece of land. I spent a couple of weeks looking around for a good location, found a very nice one on the eastern shore with a nice sunrise view and uh, yeah, on the waterfront, nice beach. And, um, and so uh, we went ahead and bought a piece of land. And then we had to put something on it uh, to try to pay the bills. Because the effective business model of Second Life, and this wasn't the original plan, but what has happened is they make their money from the land use fees. They say that you own the virtual land. It's nonsense. You pay a monthly rental fee. And if you fall behind by a couple of days, your land and everything you had on it disappears into the ether forever. Uh, so unless you're a big wheel. If you're a big wheel uh, and you, you're, you're uh, renting hundreds or thousands of um, uh, simula simulator regions from them, then you get service. But forget it if you're not one of those. Uh, so as you see, we had various things going on. We were trying to rent space in our air terminal and uh, do other things to get people to be there because there was a traffic reading. As I mentioned before with the casinos, if lots of people are there, it would get tallied up. And so when anyone was searching for interesting places or if they just happened by a place and wanted to know about it, then the information, the profile about the place would show a traffic number. And that would be based on how many avatars had been there over the past 24 hours for how, how long a time per avatar. Uh, so if you parked people, if you parked avatars there and they just sat there, then of course you could boost your uh, traffic rating. So then building. Uh, I bought some of the uh, things you see there and assembled them. Some of it I built from scratch. At that time, I was just learning uh, the tools. And then um, we got into more things, making t-shirts and so forth. Very, very easy because you just upload your, uh, your image and slap it onto a, a t-shirt. Um, and also, uh, Steve Cook is an audiophile. He started building replica audio equipment, mixers and, and um, amps and all sor sorts of things like that. And they were flying off the shelves because other audiophiles were like, oh, this looks just like the real thing. And he would script them so that you, you would touch them and, and they'd make sounds and so forth. And um, I ended up making, of all things, shoes. I never had, would have imagined that in a thousand years that I would end up making shoes. But there was a thing that frustrated me, and I think this might be the kind of thing that, that many of you can identify with. Um, it just kept nagging at me that the building tools didn't have any mirror function. And so every pair of shoes in Second Life, the left shoe and the right shoe were identical. And it just started annoying me. And so I spent the hours and, and uh, went to the great difficulty and sweat and headaches. And these are so ugly, so ugly by modern standards. But at the time, they were the first shoes in Second Life that where the left was different from the right. And so I was so happy with that. Okay, And then, uh, then I became a rapper. As I mentioned, my friend Steve Cook, my colleague, was uh, an audio nut. He had a home studio. And so we went into the home studio. Uh, what, I, I don't look like a rapper? Well, this is my avatar, King O. Dix. This is his MySpace page, which still exists. MySpace still exists. <laughs> that surprised me when I went back to check. Um, and uh, you can hear his, uh, his uh, rap tune there. Um, I, I was thinking of playing it, but then I realized there's a couple of words. You know, it's a rap tune, so there are a couple of words that maybe we, we can let people listen to on their own time. OK, and then during 2008, we said, OK, we've experienced a lot of things. And we had actually published uh, based on case studies of people who were doing creative things. We were talking about creative learning. And it was that paper that Morgan found uh, to find out who I was, which at first really creeped me out. Oh, no, I've been outed. But, uh, but it, it was a, a very fortuitous uh, meeting. Um, and so we did uh, these, these uh, 
case studies on creative learning of creative skills. And the idea was that these weren't just, oh, this person learned how to use the building tools inside Second Life. It was this person learned skills to then take outside and use either for personal development or professionally, uh, whether it be 2D graphics skills uh, or sound or, or other skills like this. Also management and business. We found a case of a nurse in the Netherlands uh, who just got in for social reasons, entertainment reasons, and ended up running an escort service with 150 part-time employees, and she was making more money and taking it out of Second Life than she made from her day job. Uh, and at that time, uh, 07, 08, there were about 5,000 people who were making more than 50,000 US uh, from, from Second Life. And again, this is separate from the land barons who were dealing with things inside Second Life, the, the um, real estate. So during 2008, we decided, okay, well, all right, what are we going to do with this in a serious way? Because, oh yes, we are trying to be educators here. So what could we do with this thing? And the first thing we came up with is, hey, the Milgram Obedience Experiment, this is part of the, the, the Stanford Prison Experiment, we can't do those things in meat space anymore, right? Uh, but maybe we could do them in Second Life. And we thought about it and realized, no, in the end, it would probably be uh, difficult. Um, and so then, since our actual job at GIST was teaching communication, uh, and the big challenge there is language learning, that's where we went. Uh, and that challenge is because students, the overwhelming majority of students uh, from Japan who enter that institution are not able to function in an English language uh, learning environment in the classroom. But they're supposed to graduate with a master's or a, or a doctorate and be able to be published and make presentations and so forth at a, at a professional level internationally. So there's a bit of a gap there. And so we thought, hey, how about we design a method to complement classroom teaching with application in Second Life. And as Morgan mentioned, we collaborated on this. And the idea is that they do normal language stuff in the classroom. They practice in pairs. They do one-on-one uh, -on -one, uh, with instructors. And that's all very time and resource intensive. And so they get, each student gets very little time, a whole lot of sweat, but very little time to do uh, practical applied kinds of communication. And of course, they're never completely authentic communications. Whereas, if they do this exercise for half an hour or 45 minutes in the classroom and then log on to Second Life, they can then engage in authentic communications with real people uh, by text or later by voice. So by 2008, there was also voice in Second Life. Uh, and apply what they have learned. Uh, so we use this method, got to have an acronym, of course, that stands for uh, shared Virtual Environment Complementing Task Achievement Training. And it was a task-based activity. Go and get somebody's business card. Go and register for an activity. Follow instructions, uh, directions to, to reach a location. Uh, give instructions. My favorite was one that Steve Cook came up with. Get money. Use any communicative strategy you can come up with and get some money and bring it back. Uh, that, that was a fun one because we did the same list of tasks in the classroom and they were uh, sent out uh, across the campus to go and, and achieve these various uh, communicative tasks. And they did come back with money. It was quite interesting. Okay. All right. And then there was the stalking thing during 2008. Uh, one of the things that, uh, that we did was social activity. And so I, I was going to this um, place. It was called Double O's. It was a James Bond-themed um, uh, nightclub. And so they had dancing. Because of course, you can script anything you want. You can upload your own BBH animations. And so there are these, there are these uh, sets that you can buy there that have uh, dances for singles or for couples. And so this, this place had dancing. And I ended up getting stalked by a woman from there. Um, and of course, my version is I did nothing to encourage it. I don't know what her version is because I ran. And I kept running. And eventually, I had to stop using this avatar for about two years and come up with a new one. So during 2009, I said, like, OK, fresh start. Let's try again. And so that's when I got involved in role playing inside Second Life for the first time. I had not gotten involved with it up to that time uh, because the first type of role playing and the dominant type of role playing in more ways than one uh, that you will hear about and encounter in Second Life is Gorian 
role playing. I don't know if anyone knows about <laughs> gore. Okay. All right. How many of you are familiar with, with gore? Okay. Enough. Uh, let's just say that it was nothing I was interested in being involved with. Um, and then I uh, encountered something fascinating, which was people trying to do uh, ancient Egypt. And I said, oh, this is more interesting. Uh, now, the size differential you see there is another classic feature of Second Life. My avatar on the left is six foot three, but you wouldn't know it because the avatar on the right is close to nine feet tall. And nearly all male avatars in Second Life just push the size to the max. I don't know what people are compensating for, but whatever it is, it's weird. Because this group uh, that Morgan and I were both involved with uh, <laughs> was dedicated to the idea of historical authenticity. That was their obsession. And if you want to read uh, Morgan's uh, doctoral thesis, which is online, you can find out more about that. Um, so I was always known as this little guy. And so I, I rolled with that to the extent of, of in the role playing, making the, the character young, uh, but still. OK, and so fateful meetings. Uh, through this uh, avatar and through this character in the Egyptian role playing, I, uh, Tinker Tailor, soldier, spy, he was a spy in Thebes sent uh, by the queen of Nubia to keep an eye on things. Um, and uh, this also, the tailor part was the most interesting because as I had never planned to make shoes, I had certainly never planned to research and make ancient Egyptian clothing. But I ended up making the, the dresses, the sandals, um, the kilts for the men, and uh, with some accessories, and selling them, mostly to the other members of the same group, but also other people would come. Uh, we did a fundraiser for a historical place, and, and I auction, auctioned off a bunch of it, and so forth. Uh, and that was all fascinating. And here we have um, a fanciful recreation of Napata um, in, in Nubia. And uh, the, as you can see, the, the building is more inspired by the uh, famous Jezer Jezeru in, on the west bank of the Nile at Thebes. But uh, there's my avatar. And there's an assassin uh, whom, he, he, as you can see, he's pretty full of himself. He's feeling good because he's about to be made vizier. Uh, and he's decided he's going to, this assassin who had initially uh, tried to kill him, he's going to um, use her as, a, as you know, a spy and agent and so forth. So he was full of it. Okay, and then the curse of the pharaohs hit. And this is tier plus time zones plus text equals drama. Tier is the term that uh, Linden Labs, the operator of Second Life, uses for their land use fees. As I mentioned before, that's how they make their money. And surprisingly, they are still making close to 100 million US a year from this. Okay. And uh, the problem is that in 2005 and 2006, they were charging $300 US per month for a 256 by 256 meter region. And today, they are still charging the same. <laughs> now, I think many of you know that the cost of operating servers, which is pretty much what they do, uh, has come down a little bit since 2003, 2005, and so forth. But their price has not come down. Uh, and this put enormous pressure, direct and indirect, on these role-playing communities. Because in Second Life, that sense of, you can do anything, and the motto was, your world, your imagination, uh, made it very easy for just anybody to get together and say, hey, let's do this, let's do this. And people would go into business and so forth. And of course, that meant that some of them would succeed and many of them would fail. Failure came in most, most role-playing groups uh, in Second Life because the enthusiasm of people who wanted to do a role-playing thing uh, would bump up against how are you going to pay the tier every month. Oh, that's OK. We'll um, have a shop and, and sell the, the goods associated with the, with the genre. Or we'll uh, rent out residential spaces, because of course, that's basically how, how the Second Life economy does succeed. And uh, um, people can donate. A lot of places you'd go in and, oh, here's our role playing place. By the way, here's the donation uh, box. Um, and of course, this was, this was not a very successful model. And we called this model the, um, the field of dreams model. Build it, and they will come. And so if you build this beautiful place, everybody will come, and, and money will follow. And it didn't. Uh, so the pressures just got worse and worse, and this led to drama. Time zones, the communication difficulties were very challenging. Morgan and I are only a couple of hours apart. Most of the people were in the UK or in the US. 
uh, and spread across the US. So it was uh, very, very challenging for people to be able to communicate about managing uh, the community. And then text-based communication. I'm sure everybody knows uh, how joyful text-based communication is uh, when it comes to human relations. So um, the result was that uh, the hubris of my character was repaid. Uh, surprisingly enough, uh, you know, the scorpion riding the frog across the river, uh, the nature of things, uh, my guy ended up stabbed in the back and tossed in the Nile. Uh, and I left that community. Uh, it's the other way around. I decided to leave that community, and so we, we had this particular role play event. Okay, and so um, uh, how many of you are brown coats? Glad to see that. Okay, so that's where I went. Uh, I took off into the black, and I did some uh, role playing based on Firefly. Uh, you see my character there is um, investigating a murder aboard somebody's ship. And uh, that was a lot of fun. It was really exciting. And of course, um, psychologically and ideologically, the, the whole uh, ethos of Firefly was liberating. But guess what? Same problems. The tier had to get paid. Time zones made it challenging for people to coordinate. And text-based communication is a killer. So um, by 2010, I said, OK, forget it. I'm just going to back off from all these things that people get really engaged with and excited about. Uh, and so I decided to go cold turkey on the drama. But I thought, hey, why not research this? This is interesting. And so I set up the role play nexus, where people came and gave talks uh, and then held discussions about uh, issues related to role playing in Second Life and, and OpenSim. By this time, OpenSim was uh, getting to be a thing. And we had about a dozen, uh, in 2010, we had about a dozen um, uh, presentations, including by Morgan and myself and many other people about many different uh, topics related to role playing. It was quite interesting and successful, um, but of course, it had to have a place. And so in 2012, when I was no longer able to get uh, Jice to pay the tier uh, on that place that you saw before, it went away. But during 2010, I, I started thinking, well, how do normal people use this thing? Not role-playing freaks and, and, and um, furries and gorians and, and, and so forth. Uh, uh, so I uh, found a very nice uh, jazz club where they had uh, live performers sometimes. They'd have DJs. And it was a nice atmosphere. It was just regular people. Uh, and so uh, my character, my avatar, uh, started hanging out there. And there is one that I still go to uh, usually on uh, Sunday nights, uh, SL time, so that's my Monday lunch time. Okay, and so a couple of years went by, it gets to be 2013, and I thought, okay, good, you know, I've backed off, I have very little engagement, uh, as I say, after the, the land went away, I had very little engagement with Second Life, uh, but then, like, uh, like the Godfather, right, whoops, uh, yes, just when I thought I was out. Um, there was a, uh, an academic, uh, Brian Carter, in, in the States had made a recreation of the Jazz Age Harlem of the 1920s. And uh, he'd had various iterations of this over the years. And he was getting ready to leave Second Life. Um, and he, uh, because I was active in OpenSim and people knew this, they recommended me. And so I started getting involved with his preparations there. And then, um, I learned a lot of new skills with the collaboration with National Taiwan Normal University, their language learning lab. And uh, this sort of brought back a lot of uh, sense of efficacy and enjoyment uh, from dealing with Second Life. And here's the campus that, uh, that we built for them, the administration building on the right. I put a lot of hours into. Uh, and we're now in the process of migrating this, which means rebuilding from scratch in a new open sim grid that they have engaged with. Okay. And so I go to parties and things, and I've got a big inventory of stuff so I can put on costumes uh, and still you know, have fun in Second Life every now and then. OK, now, already, lovely. I'm going to, just, I'm going to pick up the pace here. OK, sorry about that. All right, what things made Second Life interesting? At first, it was the frontier spirit. You could do anything, right? And there was the, um, as you can see, real time, including collaborative uh, creation of the content, whether it's sounds, objects, animations, uh, the surface texture images, and scripts to make 
things do things. Uh, all of those things were completely open to everybody. Anybody could do it. And the tools, while you know, crude and clunky in many ways and, and with uh, limitations, were nonetheless pretty quickly accessible. And many of the functions were just so easy. You could grab a sound, you could grab a, a, um, uh, an animation, and quickly just dump them into a thing called a gesture. And then you just, whatever trigger you want, a hotkey or, um, or a device that you touch, uh, um, that, or a uh, um, chat uh, string, you would, you would then, your uh, avatar would wave or holler or, or do whatever you wanted it to do. And so these sorts of things were so easy that it really encouraged people who would never have thought of it otherwise to create content. Um, and, and as I say, lead to, in some cases, they would become coders or they would become graphic artists based on this experience. Okay, in 2007, the client source was opened, and that means that now almost nobody uses the official Linden Lab uh, client viewer. Uh, nearly everybody uses one of the third party viewers the, for all all the reasons that you would anticipate. Um, and then there was a, a, a project, and the idea was that they would build a metaverse where many people would host in the same way that there are many web hosts around the world for the 2D web, and essentially build a 3D web. Um, in 2008, the first grid-to-grid -grid teleport between SL and IBM, they had a joint venture at the time, uh, uh, took place. And then uh, third-party viewers uh, came to dominate by 2010. Uh, and I'll get to a reason for that in a minute. And then in 2012, you have things like NPCs where you have, they appear to be avatars, so you don't have to actually have a separate account and run, a, run bot scripts. They were actually dedicated scripts for running NPCs. And uh, proper normal uh, mesh, I don't know if, if you're familiar with uh, 3D modeling, the Collada DAE uh, format and so forth for avatars and objects. And then normal and specular mapping before there had only been diffuse mapping on the surfaces. Okay, things that made it otherwise. Linden Lab never knew what their product was. See, there's bottom line. They don't know what their thing is. They don't know what Second Life is. If you ask them, they still can't decide whether it's a game or not. Well, is the telephone a game? You can play games over the telephone. Is Second Life uh, you know, an adult thing? Well, people do adult things on the telephone and so forth. It's a medium. It's a communications medium. OK, but they never figured that out. And they're unilateral blunders. They would go and they'd do something. People would get upset, and they'd sort of back off. And so they would continually lose trust and goodwill. They would make these unannounced sudden changes to their uh, terms of service that would disrupt. As I say, there are people who were making their livings uh, from Second Life, and suddenly their business was destroyed. Uh, gambling is a good example. In 2007, all of a sudden, the rug got pulled out. It wasn't here, we have to give you a warning. Here's the legal situation in the US. We may not be able to continue gambling, make your preparations. It was, it's done. And this is their pattern. Uh, customer service. Ask Morgan uh, if you get a chance about customer service from Linden Labs. Six months to reply. Okay. <laughs> All right. Uh, then you have the progressively unrealistic costs in addition to what I mentioned before. Um, the merchants themselves, many of the people who made stuff, but more importantly, people who would buy and resell objects uh, in Second Life, got this mentality that, oh, we can sell the same widget for the same price forever after it's lost all novelty and after better things have been, uh, you know, newer and better things have been made. And that mentality uh, it really permeates Second Life. Um, then we had the limits of the architect architecture. Because it's, uh, each simulator is a separate server process, then essentially when the avatar goes from one to another, it logs you off of here and logs you on to there. And so it's a seamless experience for the user. Uh, but this makes it very difficult uh, since stuff has to be loaded. Uh, for example, if you're flying an airplane, or driving a sports car in a straight line, you're going to have problems relatively quickly. Um, and then prim limits, in order to try to keep uh, performance reliable, there are strict limits on the number of object parts, uh, like Lego bricks, uh, the primitives. Um, then this timeline is very important, uh, so I'll try to go through it. But um, Corian Draco was the CTO, and he is the person responsible for all of the important features of Second Life the money, the real-time uh, user-generated uh, content, including collaboration, and the, the emphasis on essentially what I would say is 
open by default mentality. Okay, and the, um, so uh, Rosedale comes and says, well, this isn't the metaverse I thought I was paying for, and booted on Jacob. Uh, and that's also when the gambling man hit. And so that was the first time people were going, oh, wait, is this thing really oh, going to continue to be okay? 2008, uh, Rosedale leaves his CEO, he's lost interest, brings in just a business guy who tried his best, but didn't, what is this thing? He didn't know. Well, you know, it was Web 2.0 was the, the, the hype at the time, and Skype and Facebook were the big deal, so let's try to make the viewer look more like a web browser, and let's put in voice features and, and things to make it look like Skype and, and Facebook. Well, you know, obviously that's not what the medium is. It's a medium beyond all of that, and it, yeah. Um, in 2009, the motto, your world, your imagination, just quietly disappeared. Uh, and the, the SL marketplace, which there had been several marketplaces that had been set up by normal users. Um, Linden just bought them out and set up their own uh, clunky one. They decided that they had gotten bad press about you know, adult entertainment and activities. So they set up a ghetto, an X-rated ghetto called Zindra. Uh, and they were receiving lawsuits. This was very important and had enormous impact. They were scared. And, you can't blame them. They're in the United States. Lawsuits, wow. OK, so um, they uh, also introduced, as I said, this new viewer client. And everybody hated it. No one wanted it. Uh, so in 2010, it was forced. People were really upset. And then the worst thing was a sudden unilateral TOS change. And it was all your content are belong to us. And people were totally freaked out. It wasn't as scary as it looked. Uh, it was simply they looked at what everybody else, the Googles and the Yahoos and the Facebooks were doing, and said, you know, well, if Google says all of your e email is theirs to sell, then, you know. Um, and so in 2012, uh, the new uh, CEO had been a guy uh, running The Sims online. And so he brought in this whole gamification. The problem is no one knew whether it was a game, so let's make it more of a game. But it's not a game, so that didn't work real well. Uh, and then the educational discount. And this is the worst thing that they ever did for their, um, f for many reasons. And that is, educators were very active in Second Life, and they were the ones who gave the thing good press. In the middle of a fiscal and academic year, they suddenly announced, "Oh, your 50% discount is gone." Oops. Um, educators, uh, needless to say, most of them hate Linden Lab and Second Life now. Uh, it was the best boon for OpenSim that came along. Okay, so I'm just, uh, and the user and uh, creator divide started to widen again because with the new features of Mesh and, and the uh, specular maps and so forth, this meant that people who had access to professional tools like Blender and so forth, they could make much higher quality stuff. And so the incentive or the ease with which people could get into creation disappeared. OK, OpenSim, free open source version of the SL server, same clients, count me in. Okay, Hypergrid, this allows you to have an account and log in in one place. And like linking to another website, you can go to another grid. And you can have self-hosting. You have control over your own content and, and back it up, which you can't do with Second Life. And so, yes, let's get away from uh, the incompetence and, and, and so forth. Okay. So here are, are two of my avatars from two different grids meeting on a third grid. Okay. And so I'm going to skip along here since time's wasting. Um, in my own time, just when I come home tired from work, I can tinker away at an Egyptian temple uh, or whatever. The spirit, that frontier spirit, is back right, with OpenSim. And here is. Here are some of the things that developed. And there are 100, you know, let 100 flowers bloom. Lots of grids available. And gradually, more and more of them are opening up. Ones that began as commercial ventures or are still commercial ventures, and they wanted to keep everything closed, uh, have been uh, more and more opening up because that's what works. OK, and so here's my happy avatar in his own happy Egypt. OK, what, what's wrong? Why hasn't OpenSim taken over the world? Well, we have. Um, a real problem, and that is, as I mentioned before, this closed uh, something for nothing mentality that pervades Second Life has uh, sort of uh, so pervaded it that anybody coming from Second Life toward OpenSim is still full of these kinds of ideas. And so, oh, we can't go there. They'll copy my content. 
And so the people who are developing the core program and also features like the hypergrid are constantly under the misapprehension. This is a huge misapprehension. Oh, in order to get people to adopt, to come over, to, to, to use our thing, we have to put on all these restrictions. And of course, they do that. And it, there was a year and a half where hypergrid, no new features and bug fixes took place because the, the developer was focusing on putting in all these restrictions on the movement of content. And the result of that was, guess what? All the restrictions are there, but where are the users? They are not there. What a surprise. And so you have a lot of FUD. And the people who should be fighting the FUD are actually pandering to it or succumbing to it. And uh, that's what's wrong. And that's why um, OpenSim hasn't caught on. OK. And so we're here to lessons maybe. OK. The problem that I see are that who the users are, well, I just don't see the prosumer or the maker uh, the way that I used to in Second Life back in, in 07 or so. And you have people who are accustomed to just consuming content or being that which is consumed by adver advertisers, right? And uh, what do they want? They want dollhouse and dress up. If you want to make money online, whether it's an MMO or Second Life, uh, the way to do it is allow users to have a house and decorate it and decorate their, their characters or avatars. Okay, and what do people hear and see? Everyday normal people, right? They listen to the world according to RIAA and patent trolls and think, oh, that's, you know, how it should be. Okay, so what should we do? What I would like to say is please hang in there, speak up, as I'm sure you're already uh, doing, and have faith. Technology trends toward openness, truth, and freedom and so forth. Uh, so uh, I have a lot of faith that if we just stick with it, history is on our side. So thank you very much for joining me on this uh, Odyssey. And um, I have a couple of links for you. If you are interested in checking out some open sim grids or in seeing what's still going on in Second Life, uh, the Singularity Viewer is one that I recommend. It allows you to make stuff and then export it. Uh, even from Second Life. And then King O'Dix, his uh, rap tune is available as you see there. And then my, it's my email address if you'd like to contact me. I look forward to uh, talking with anybody who's interested some more. And Morgan is saying we might have a uh, BOF? Yeah, we might have a Okay, all right. So thank you all very, very much. And I'm very happy to take any questions you have right now. Just yell. Yeah, I'm not very familiar with Yes. Well, in OpenSense, there is anarchy environment because each person can host his own environment and then decide whether to connect it over a network so that other so that he can go to other places and others can visit. And two lives are hostage to whatever the operator decides. So it is a, depending on your interpretation, benevolent dictatorship. And there are some open sim grids that operate exactly with the same model, but they provide better service uh, than, than Linden does. Uh, but as far as the idea of any kind of democratic representation, Linden has always been very deaf. Uh, to normal users. The, the big wheels or the squeaky wheels or people with lawsuits, they listen to them. Uh, but uh, everyday people don't, have never had much of a voice. There were people back in 06, 07 talking about, well, let's have some kind of representation uh, and, and so forth, and that went nowhere. Yeah. There was no reason, no incentive. Yeah. Okay, other questions? Yes? Um, yeah. yeah. Yes. Yes, it is. Uh, OpenSim is, is completely open. Yes. People can post it wherever they want. Yep. Why don't they strip all the restrictions out? 
Well, that's an excellent question. And if I were a developer, or if I had a friendly developer, uh, that is something that I would love to see is, it would have to be a fork, uh, because the, the, the core group, they've made this decision that this is how they're going to go. Um, I think they're mistaken in their reasoning. Um, but uh, yes, a fork would be perfectly uh, legitimate and eagerly welcomed by many creative people. I can't tell you how much, how many man hours I have lost from the distraction of every time I upload an object, every time I want to share it or receive it, I have to click these check boxes to permit things that should be available by default. Yeah. yeah. Other questions? So how's, how's the money flow? Well, OpenSim. Well, OpenSim is free and open, uh, so if you already have a, if you already have a um, web connection, then you can host yourself for free. Now, as far as money flow, if the, if you're engaged in a commercial activity, different uh, grids have different business models. I mentioned uh, there's one called InWorlds that essentially runs the same business model as Second Life, but because they provide more and more intimate and friendly service, uh, they're very successful. I, I don't know their, their money figures, uh, but they've been going now for about five or six years. Well, uh, usually they don't pay subscription. Uh, membership is, is generally free, uh, but you pay for uploads and you pay for the rental of virtual land. And so other things flow from that. Right. Well, again, again, there are so many users who are steeped in this, um, you know, closed IP mentality of uh, I, I built it so I can sell infinite iterations of it for the same money as the first one, and then the consumers who go along with that kind of model. So, so you can have a closed commercial grid with that kind of restrictive uh, content mentality and have it succeed because of. Of the, of the population. There are many others uh, who have different models. There's a very interesting one called Kitely that started in 2012. I didn't have time to, to talk about them in detail before. Um, and their idea is the server is served on the cloud, on the Amazon cloud. And, and the advantage of that is that Second Life or other uh, open uh, um, environments, if you want to be there whenever people wander in, that means your server is running 24-7. Whereas with, with Kitely, the server process isn't running until somebody wants to go to that place. And so they started out, and they were able to, to charge very, very low, you know, 10 cents an hour and this sort of thing. Um, and uh, the, the problem was that people couldn't make the mental adjustment to understand how it worked. And so they've had to adjust their, their pricing packages uh, so that they're, they're still operating the same way, but the way they charge is, is uh, more traditional now. But you pay between five and twenty-five dollars uh, U.S. a month for a space that, in in Second Life, still costs three hundred and is a one thousand dollars startup fee. So you could buy your laptop, run your own for a year, and you would still save money. Yeah. Okay. Thank right. you very much. Okay. Thank you all very much. <laughs>